Um, this lecture is uh, actually a blueprint on a book I'm writing on now, or yeah, well, yes, um, starting to write on that. It's also to a large extent, of course, based on this book that I've already written that Vivke mentioned. I wrote it during my time at Lund University and it's almost 600 pages or 592 in Swedish. And that book presents Swedish spas during its first 200 years. And the study makes use of a wide range of disciplines from history of ideas and history of science, intellectual history, comparative literature to theology, philosophy and, uh, and the arts and also medicine, of course that I've studied once upon a time. The analysis uh, rests on a study of hydrotherapeutic literature, medical records, uh, journals, information about organization and economy, and spa statistics that was diligently delivered to the state archives, but also on prayers and sermons used at the spas and uh, on literary and aesthetic sources such as poems or, or pictures of spa life, but also on more personal sources, such as letters and diaries of the spa guests. The main part of the study explores the notion of the spa as a paradise on earth, uh, using the Christian story of creation in Genesis chapters one through three as a pattern of analysis. And the object of the study is to reconstruct the ideas and expectations connected to spa life during this period, rather than to tell the story of different spas or critically examine the medical effects of these uh, different cures. Special att attention is almost always uh, paid on these utopian aspects of spa culture and maybe also on the position of women. In another publication that I want to mention, I've also explored the possibility of interpreting Swedish spa culture of the 18th century as enlightenment in practice. The character traits of the, the enlightenment were juxtaposed with ideas connected with the Swedish watering places. Uh, not only in order to say something significant about the spa culture, but also in an effort to contribute both to the discussion of uh, enlightenment in general and to the specific question of whether or not there was uh, an enlightenment in Sweden. That was a very much debated question at the time. And in this article, where I argue that the Swedish spa appears at, as a center for interpretation, communication and propagation of enlightenment ideas. I found a number of important notions, uh, you can imagine, like nature, reason, uh, utility, health, happiness, uh, science and medicine. And claim that these were equally relevant uh, for the enlightenment discussion and for the ideology of spa culture. Furthermore, severe criticism of civilization, strong interest in nature, climate and the environmental issues, as well as an allocation of empirical research. They are all major features in both enlightenment and spa culture. The important uh, connection between reason, ethics and education, well known from enlightenment text, is also prominent in text dealing with spa cures. Both cultures also claim to combat uh, prejudices and superstition, both in theory and practice. And I found it quite easy to compile examples of this from the Swedish sources. And I think you can probably find it in your studies as well, if you feel like it. It is a very interesting aspect, I think. As Vibken mentioned, I've also published uh, other articles and also been a curator, curator of this Swedish Spa Museum in the 1990s. But the title of uh, today's uh, talk is this A Paradise on Earth, just, just focusing on utopian aspects of Swedish spas and watering places. And now I'll try to share my screen. Well, I will soon try to share my screen. I have to get rid of a lot of things and open my 
PowerPoint that I should have done earlier on with the button, but I will do it now. I think this might be it. Are you possibly seeing my screen? Uh, yes. yes, 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 we do. Good. If you lose sight of it, just shout. Um, this is the cover of my book. Um, and in this lecture, I'll explore the idea of the spa as a small utopian society where rules and regulations were different from ordinary world, from the ordinary world around them. And you could experiment with ideals such as liberty, equality and fraternity, and even the rights of women, at least for a couple of weeks in the short Swedish summer. Um, belief in the curative capacity of water seems to be present in many cultures around the world. And the Swedish spa culture often claims a history from the baths of ancient Rome. This is a picture from 1899 by the British painter Sir Lawrence Almatadema, showing, I would say, not so much the thermal baths of the Emperor Caracalla as the title claims, nor indeed spa life in Britain at a later date, but rather the artist's image of an ideal spa culture, very much influenced by his late Victorian ideas, with naked young men in the background and lush and sensitive women up front. Let me show you the women see what I mean? Many varieties of ideal images, even wishful thinking, far from the sordid reality of sickness and bodily ailments, have become interesting parts of the history of spa culture. One cherished idea is the notion of a spring of youth, um, fountain of youth maybe, fat, famously illustrated in the painting by Lucas Kranich, the elder from 1546. Many recent posters and advertisements use this association uh, to the possibility of regaining some of your youth or at least living a healthier and longer life. You can see this in a picture from Baden by V. In a, a poster from Saint Raphael in the south of France. And one from Baden Baden maybe the most famous of them all. Some ideal images are easily observed already in the architecture of the spas. There are tangible examples of the wish to connect later spas with antiquity all around the world. Ian Rockle in his Taking the Waters Early Spas in New Zealand informs his readers that one of the buildings at the baths of Rotorua was fashioned with Ionian pillars even though it was a structure raised in the 19th century and made of wood. This is also the case with the oldest and most famous Swedish spa called Mia de Vin, founded in 1678. This building is from 1809. Antiquity seems to inspire confidence, maybe even strength and prosperity. But in this invocation of times far gone, there is also something of a critique of the present state of, of uh, civilization. This critical stance is an interesting trait in spa literature, especially obvious in the utop utopian aspects. Many writers claim that the multitude of visitors at spas and watering places in Europe, there were millions, and in Sweden, at least thousands every summer in the middle of the 19th century, shows that something was decidedly wrong with ordinary life. Especially the European cities, with their rapid pulse and inadequate sewers, were considered to be unhealthy places for both body and soul. The establishment of spas with a closer affinity to nature then seemed like a good idea.
Medve is the oldest among the Swedish spas established in 1678, and Sweden seems to be the only Nordic country that successfully established a spa already in the 17th century. But the mineral waters of Ramlösa and Luka, still served in restaurants around the world, comes from Swedish spas established in the 18th century. And some of these have been restored in recent years and can be still visited today. The establishment of spas in Sweden had, a spe had some special reasons. In the 17th century, Sweden had developed into a political and military superpower in Europe and become the second largest country after Russia. But it had, had no corresponding cultural position. Spa culture, imported from the continent and the British Isles, became an attempt to obtain better health care, medical education and refined customs, but also a better cultural standing. Another advantage was, of course, that the economic resources remained within the country. People didn't go to continental spas. Swedish spas differ in several, several ways from the rest of Europe, as far as I can see. They were often situated in the countryside, frequently in the middle of nowhere. They differed from European spas also in the respect that they hardly ever created anything you could call a spa town unless it was situated in the city from the beginning. This created a lot of practical problems, but also offered some special opportunities. Protestant Sweden was poor and sparsely populated. The spas remained small measured by European standards, even during the 19th century or the 20th for that matter, when the number of spa guests multiplied because of the growth of the bourgeoisie. Nevertheless, thousands of people visited the Swedish spas every summer. The custodian of the spa, if that is the position, what the position should be called, is often also the spa physician. And there is no competition between different doctors at the Swedish spas. There might be an assistant who takes care of the poor at the spa, but that's all. Among the favorable features of Swedish spa history is the scientific status they gained early on, thanks to their founding fathers. This is a picture of one of them, the father of the Swedish spas, founder of Medevi in the summer of 1678, was a well-known physician and an experimental chemist called Urban Järne. He is also famous in Swedish history for ending the witch trials of the time. Good man there. Moreover, the Swedish scientist uh, and medical doctor, Carl Linnaeus, visited spas during his travels around the country, published treatises on spa life and described the ideal life of the spa. He declared that your state of mind was essential to the salutary effects of spa cure and that a pleasant social life was an important part of the medical cure at the spa. It's important for the emerging spa culture that Linnaeus was very clear on this point and that his colleagues concurred. Another of the, the important Swedish uh, men of uh, early spa culture is the chemist Johan Jakob Berzelius, also uh, involved in spa culture, especially in the production of artificial mineral waters around the turn of the century 1800. But when it comes to the utopian and more fanciful ideas connected to early spa life in Sweden, the most important figure is probably a woman, Aurora Königsmark. Uh, this in a, is in a fanciful build of a uh, picture of her dancing at the spa of Medvi in 1682. If Urban Järne was the Adam, then uh, Aurora Königsmark was the eve of the creation of Swedish spa life. The first and foremost of the Swedish spa queens was Aurora Königsberg, a lady of the king's court who visited the spa of Medevi in the summer of 1682, when the spa was very new and she was only 20 years of age. She uh, went there together with her mother and her sister Amalia. And she reported on her visits in letters to a female cousin called Ebba. These letters gave a glamorous, though not altogether truthful account of spa life at Medevi in the 1680s. And as these letters were circulated in many copies among the Swedish nobility at the time, 
they managed to make a visit to the spa of Medevi seem fashionable and remarkable indeed. She happily used the writer's poetic freedom to embellish her impressions so, and exaggerate the beauty of spa life and the importance of the guests and herself. She had a clear eye for the theatrical and her accounts sometimes resemble a play or an opera rather than description of a day at, in the countryside or at a health resort. But Aurora Koenigsmark does not see or at least not acknowledge the misery. Spa life to her is a refined and elegant display of fashionable nobility, and it worked miracles for the establishment of the spa of Medellin. The image of the old spas has often been dominated by rich people who visit the, the, the spa for fun, or at least made that impression. But at least the economy of the Swedish spas often rested on the more numerous ordinary guests of all ages, from small children to old men, simple people who came for all kinds of reasons, mainly for a time of rest, in the hope of better health and a longer life. And the social life at the spa almost always contained philanthropic elements, charity balls, concerts and theatre performances, whose profits went to the poor at the spa. However, there were always problems. Sweden has no hot springs at all, as far as I know, and the climate in Sweden is not really favorable for a spa. The summer season is short and the economy rests on a narrow base. The necessity to create a romantic garden placed great demands on the garden architects of the time, and the starting point was often a lousy swamp with only thickets and shrubs. Um, here you can see two picture postcards uh, showing the spa of Sätra and maybe you can see that they are basically or actually exactly the same um, but the first one is called uh, you see on top in Swedish Björnbovreten I can't really say that I know what it means but it doesn't sound very nice and it doesn't look very nice either but the Second picture down in the right front is called the Engelska Parken, which of course means the English park, which was the ideal for a park, a cool park in, in Sweden as in, in uh, everywhere else. But as you see, uh, it doesn't really uh, impress you, does it? Some of the utopian aspects of spa life was founded on religion and the Christian tradition. The creator of the universe is supposed to be bountiful and on earth, in the beautiful Garden of Eden, the necessities of life were available for free. Also, there were no hierarchies. When Adam delved and Eve span, who was then a gentleman, as the saying goes. This sometimes became the ideal for spa culture as well. Moreover, there is a New Testament connection to water through the Christian baptism, of course, in water, but also through the image of Christ on the cross, where his wounds give up both blood and water. This was used within spa culture in Sweden. Look at this picture. Uh, it's a sort of fountain of Christ taken uh, from uh, an illustration to a spa sermon published in Sweden in 1689. The illustration shows the close connection between the mineral waters curing the body and the blood of Christ healing the soul. The practical results of these theological reflections was that the healing water was considered as a gift from God and therefore must be offered to be free to all human beings. This was the ideal and it was actually often also the case in Swedish spas at the time. Even the poor and destitute did have access to the mineral waters for free, but they might be required to visit the spring very early in the morning before the paying guests arrived and keep out of sight. However, they got a time of rest, they got food and medical care at the appointed hospital. Here you can see the hospital for the poor at the of the spot, beginning of, in the middle of the 19th century. 
The representatives of the old spa culture in Sweden emphasized that one must put all one's worries aside and approach the spa with a carefree mind. When staying at the spa, you were not allowed to think about things that darkened your mood, money, family problems, work, competition and a career. You should rest and acquire a peace of mind so that you became receptive to the positive effects of a cure. Then, as now, people seem to have been aware that there are a lot of lifestyle diseases you know, converted to that um, time of, of the world, that these lifetime diseases cannot be so easily treated with chemical means. Instead, you should perhaps change your way of living, eating, drinking and thinking, perhaps your whole attitude to life. The utopian ambition to make the spa into a paradise on earth provided a medical motivation to create an aesthetically pleasing environment, a beautiful garden, a cool park with flowering shrubs, shadowing trees and winding paths. Spa life should also offer innocent pleasures, excursions in the countryside, lively conversation, music and dance. Spas should create conditions for a free and happy interaction between people without too many restrictions. Bodily exercise was considered very beneficial and it is said that Swedish physiotherapy emerged within the spa culture. Trips to spas turn out to be the first more democratic holiday trips, recreational trips for individuals or entire families. Prior to that, people had to visit relatives or friends in the countryside during the summer months. Through the spa culture, new opportunities were created. You could also travel abroad, supporting a trend of, of foreign tourism. Even if the actual spa could not really aspire to be a paradise on earth, the utopian aspects was nonetheless important as a part of spa culture. Spa literature, such as medical treatises, spa sermons, as well as diaries, letters and poetry written by the spa guests, all show that people were fully aware of this idea. The spa culture in Sweden did include some utopian features. You could socialize both between the sexes and between social classes in a much freer way. It was part of the healthy life at the spa. And even the Swedish royal family could for a short time dispense with their titles and live a simpler life, dancing or gardening, talking with ordinary people. And from now on, I'm focusing on these utopian aspects, uh, especially those of liberty and equality, and try to show you some Swedish examples. Uh, though this picture is actually from a bit British 18th century spa with a common bath. I don't know if that, this is true either. But anyway, in the microcosm of a spa community, you could experiment with ideas about liberty, liberty and equality by far transcending the strict hierarchy of everyday society. This is evident from research done also in Britain and Germany, as well as in Sweden. In Britain, Phyllis Hembry, for instance, gives some examples in her uh, English spa histories from 1560 to the present in two volumes. And in Germany, Reinhold Kuhner, the Urbanität of the Lande, Bad Reisen nach Piermont im 18. Jahrhundert, claimed that spas such as Piermont in the 18th century spread the more utilitarian ideas of the Enlightenment. And I will now give you a few Swedish examples. In Sweden, all the paying guests at the spa formed a unity called the spa community, where everyone, at least in principle, was treated as equals. In Sweden, some of the larger spas even had a special jurisdiction. At the spa, the guests could be free from the cumbersome and conventions of higher society, at least from some of them. This could result in a variety of different rules and regulations in, in themselves. Sometimes you were not allowed to use any titles at the spa, even though that was the usual and polite way to address people at the time. 
And sometimes nobody was allowed to visit their friends or announce their arrival or departure from the spa, though otherwise that would be expected. Men were sometimes not allowed to raise their hats in greeting to a lady, a habit that could be very difficult to curb. And women were sometimes not supposed to wear fashionable dresses in satin or silk. And I must admit that I have not only said this, said, seen this idea launched in a novel, not in, in a real life story. And most importantly, almost everybody could engage in conversation or walk in the garden or play cards or dance in the evening with everyone else. Some of the most interesting examples of these utopian traits that I found on, in my research on spa history, I have gathered in, I think, five or six examples. Oops. This, for instance. Uh, this is a handwritten newspaper from uh, the Spa of Mashstrand in the summer of 1849. It is called Hafskatten, uh, which is sort of uh, literally translated as sea cat, I suppose. Could probably be a fish. Uh, it says this is the official newspaper of the Republic, and on the third line you can perhaps see uh, that they use the French Revolution slogan of liberté, égalité, fraternité. The famous ideals uh, whose heading this newspaper uh, manufactured at the Swedish Palm Mastrand in 1849. That year, the spa guests had decided to extend the common spa tradition to utopian dimensions and make a playful summer revolution. Highly respected and even politically rather conservative people men and women of the middle or higher classes in Sweden partook in this venture. And in their handwritten newspaper, they claimed that they founded a republic in the middle of the monarchic uh, country of Sweden. They introduced communist principles, literally so. They abolished the institution of marriage and they declared the full emancipation of women. After this revolution, nobody got more coffee or more cake than anyone else. And that uh, the evening dances, the ladies could just as well ask the gentlemen for a waltz as the other way around. Many new laws were decided upon by their specially appointed parliament, uh, where each and every guest at the spa, even the women, got a, got a vote. On the other hand, the freedom of this republic was of the anarchistic kind and stated that you did not have to abide by any of these laws if they were against your enlightened opinion. See why I think there is a definite link to enlightenment ideas. Yeah. Republic, communist principles, abolished the institution of marriage and declared the full emancipation of women. It was certainly not a coincidence that one of the spa guests that summer was the pioneer of Swedish rights, women's rights in Sweden, a very popular author at the time by the name of Fredrika Bremer, considered to be the, say, Jane Austen of Sweden. It is well known that Fredrika Bremer previously had studied the ideas of uh, utopian socialists uh, by um, the ideas of Pierre Joseph Proudhon, for, for instance, as well as the utopian socialist Henri de Saint Simon and his more fanciful colleague Charles Fourier. Frédéric Abriam stayed at the spa for a month before going on a long voyage to the United States, the New World, as she would call, later call it in a published travel. In a letter she wrote from this uh, uh, summer at Mastrand, you can see her ideas. This is a letter to a very dear male friend of hers, Per Johan Bickley, um, and she wrote as follows. I have now spent one month among the cliffs of the county of Bohuslän. 
on a rock in the midst of the sea called Mastran. Here I've seen my sister Agatha become hearty and well again, played Republic and the communism with a cheerful bathing community, arranged parties, written poetry, all with political illusions. We have fought seriously, though within playful and beautiful bounds. Okay. It's obvious that Federica Bremer was excited about these radical ideas, and she didn't hesitate to say so. And she wrote another letter uh, to another friend, a rather conservative professor of theology and studies, Christian Erik Falkans, soon to be appointed bishop. It reads as follows. We now have a fully organized, impressive republic with the most radical tendencies, equality, red color, emancipation of all kinds, a parliament, as well as newspapers, etc. Agatha is our secretary, Count Eric Sparri is our first minister. We changed our president so often that I do not know who it is today. Our gatherings are also. We are looking forward to great changes. This experiment with equality at the spa was not only an idea of one exceptional Swedish woman and her obliging companions. Neither was it an idea born exclusively out of the bourgeois revolution in Europe in 1848, uh, the year before she went to Marstrand. Uh, Frederike Bremen had actually used this idea of equality at the spa as an author uh, of novels more than 10 years earlier. In the novel Nina, published in 1835, she describes the spa guests going to the mineral springs at the Spa of Ramlösa in the south of Sweden in the morning. And I quote her in a sort of ad hoc translation. No, I don't. Hmm. I should. Um, I uh, see if I find that a little later on then. This is the most um, obvious example of the tradition of equality at the spa, written by the poet Johan Henrik Kjellgren, who visited the spa of Medevi in 1783. He took the idea of equality at the spa absolutely for granted. He put all the noble titles of his acquaintances within brackets when writing letters to his friends in Stockholm, and he offered the obvious explanation in a sentence included in one of these letters. He wrote, at the spa, all men are equal. Another example concerns the visit of a Swedish king to the spa of Medvedi. Apparently, even royalty could choose to conform to the ideals of equality at the spa. King Gustavus III, Sweden's most illustrious king, the one who was assassinated at an opera ball in Stockholm in 1792, and inspired Giuseppe Verdi to write an opera on the subject in 1859. He went to the spa of Medevi in the summer of 1780 in the company of many men and women from his royal court in Stockholm. And one of these people, the Baron Gustav Johan Adamsvard, uh, confessed in his diary how utterly baffled he was by the egalitarian behavior of the king and his court and especially actually by the fashionable noble women who behaved quite differently from at home. And I will, as you see, venture some kind of translation of his entry in his diary as well. He wrote as follows, I quote, life at the spa is so very different from life at court. The sight of it shows the strangest contrast to those of us who reflect thereupon. The same ladies of the court, that in Stockholm, with all their airs of gentility, believe themselves to be queens, now find themselves surrounded by tobacco smoking card players, by suitors in simple coats, as well as by young women of the bourgeoisie. This spectacle struck my untrained eyes, and I tried to make fun of the ladies, but they declared that they were quite satisfied with their present freedom. The courtier Adamsvard is amazed by the fundamental differences when he compares spa culture to the royal court. 
the mix of people of different gender and position is unusual, but even more surprising is the fact that nobody maintains or even marks the social boundaries. And when he mocks the noble ladies and makes fun of their motley society, he is almost rebuked and receives the anonymous answer that they appreciate and enjoy their current freedom. Furthermore, this is no small, specially selected or perhaps liberty-minded society. Rather, Adams, I suspect that more or less the whole nobility of Stockholm has followed King Gustav III to nearly that sum. My next example concerns the son of Gustavus III, King Gustavus Adolphus IV. This is a picture showing him arriving, arriving at Lied in 1798, six years after his father's death. Um, the same tendency to value an unusually amount of equality is noted when he visits the spa. This is uh, not only six years since uh, his father was murdered, it is also 10 years after the outbreak of the French Revolution, whereas the visit of his father, Gustavus III, occurred more almost 10 years before the revolution. However, the spa tradition of utopian liberty seems more or less unbroken. The resident physician at spa at the time, Sven Anders Hedin, uh, wrote, uh, spa literature and he claims that the young king set a very good example of the equality at the spa during his visit in 1798. Dr. Hedin was surprised but very pleased to find the king deigning to converse with all kinds of people at the spa just to make a point and show how important indeed necessary the equality of the spa was to the cure. Hedin assures his reader so that he had seen nothing like that before. There is, of course, always a problem with historical texts declaring all men are equal. It's supposed to mean all, all mankind, say both men and women, and all classes. But is it this really the case, and are all social strata included? As you well know, this is seldom the case, at least not in the 18th or 19th century. At the spas, I'm sure that the really poor and non-paying guests, as well as the servants, were excluded. Possibly also some of the peasants, but not necessarily all of them, at least not always. And women were sometimes included. Let us examine the notion further in an example that includes a woman, uh, namely a queen, a Swedish queen, and a peasant. Queen Desideria uh, has uh, visited the spa of Ramlösa in the summer of 1826. Queen Desideria of Sweden is perhaps more known as, well known as Desiree Clary, once the fiancée of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. But now she was a uh, queen of Sweden. And in the summer of 1829 at Ramlösa Spa, it is said that she unknowingly danced with a common peasant, dressed up for the evening by the governor of this spa. It was later presented to the queen as something of a joke, or maybe a childish daring, or maybe even a bet. But a significant part of the story is that it is said that the queen herself, according to the story again, found this okay. She claimed that she was glad that a man of the people could give such a good impression. And the young peasant Ugla was the hero of the spa community that summer. I don't think that that would have been a probable scenario at the Royal Palace in Stockholm or anywhere else outside the spa sphere. But unfortunately, I'm not at all sure that this story is true. It's published almost a century later. But it testifies to some extent to the fact that daring experiments with the utopian ideas at the spas were considered possible. The story is not presented as totally improbable, only 
remarkable and unusual and fun. Thank you for your attention. I think I will stop there and make uh, room for comments and discussions. And I will also search for this uh, lost uh, slide with a reference to Nina, the novel of Ulrika Bena. I will now stop sharing the screen with you. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think while uh, we wait for Wiebke to take over the comments, um, I repeat the invitation to use the chat to formulate questions that Henrike will collect. Yes, thank you very much, Elisabeth, for this inspiring lecture about utopian aspects of Swedish spas. It was especially interesting since I guess most of us have known nothing or only very little about Swedish spas before, which actually lie at the periphery of the European spa landscape. And in my comment, I will therefore focus on the peculiarities of Swedish spas and on their relation to continental spas. You mentioned that Swedish spas differ uh, in some cases and in some aspects to continental spa, from continental spas. And I will also address more general questions and not only questions that are connected to the utopian aspects of Swedish spas, since I think the audience would be interested to learn more about Swedish spas in general. I have two major points with several minor questions. My first point concerns the special situation of Swedish spas compared to continental spas. As you mentioned, Sweden imported spas from Central Europe and from Britain. And the reasons which you mentioned were to obtain better health care, better medical education, to obtain refined customs and a better cultural standing. And my first question is how this cultural and medical transfer took place. Were Swedish doctors or rulers only reading about foreign spas? Or did they travel to European spas to learn more about them and imported their knowledge directly to Sweden? I ask this because I know that in late 18th century Germany, for instance, German doctors and rulers who wanted to establish a seaside resort visited several German continental spas and imported directly their architecture and structure. Now, were there any specific continental spas Swedish doctors and rulers visited in order to transfer their structures and architecture to Sweden? Do you have any specific examples for such a transfer? That would be something which I would be interested in. I don't know if you can answer this question, but I uh, thought I might ask it anyway. Yes, it's a very good question. Do you want me to try to answer it now or do you want to pose all your questions first? And Yes, I, I think I continue. If, if it's okay, I would I would like to continue, and then you, you okay. get the opportunity to answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Special features and travels and things. Yes, mm -hmm. that's the Thank first one. Okay. Yes, and then I'm interested about the remedies remedies of Swedish spas and what were there different kinds of spas on the continent. We can distinguish between different kinds of spas, as you all know, mineral spas, climatic spas. Spas with mud treatments, spas with hot springs, seaside resorts. And now you told us that Sweden has neither hot springs nor a favorable climate to build a spa upon. <laughs> so were all Swedish spas mineral spas or were there other treatments as well? For example, mm -hmm. mud. That would also be something which I yep. was interested in. Yes. And I think... It's very interesting that Swedish spas all were placed in the countryside and never developed into towns. So what were the reasons for this? And what common ingredients of a continental spa did they have? Did they have a pump room, a promenade, a cour park, a cour house, a grand hotel, a casino, 
I would like to know more about how Swedish spa looked like to better understand how it functioned actually. Yes. Last but not least, I would like to know to what extent Swedish spas were transnational places. Since, as you know, our European spa project focuses on this aspect and has the hypothesis that transnationality was an important aspect of the European spa. And so my question is, was it also for Swedish spas? Were there foreign guests or at least guests from the neighboring Nordic countries? How far did people travel to visit a Swedish spa? Did the spas attract only people from the closer region or from all over Sweden, including Finland and in the 19th century Norway, which um, belonged to Sweden then? And what about the doctors? Were they all Swedish or did they even come from other countries? And the same question can be asked for the numerous seasonal spa workers. On the continent, there was a transnational flow of spa workers, and did this even reach Sweden? My second point concerns the utopian aspects of spa life on which you focused in your lecture. You mentioned that spas were both distinct from ordinary society and similar to it. The spa was a microcosm, or in other words, a laboratory where people could experiment with different rules and greater freedom. This is something which has often been claimed in the literature, and you mentioned this as well, but you really give some very interesting and really puzzling specific examples for the utopian aspects of equality and liberty in Swedish spas. I was really impressed by these examples. And the example of the Revolutionary Republic of Marstrand in 1849 was really amazing, I think and Friedrika Bremer's writings about it. Yeah. I've never heard so of such an experiment in a spa before. And I would at this point like to encourage the audience to come up with similar examples from the continent so that I would uh, encourage us all to collect other examples so that we can compare the specific examples of greater Swede freedom in spas between Sweden and the rest of Europe. And I would like to ask you, Elisabeth, to enlarge upon the aspect that in spite of the utopia of equality and liberty, in the end, not all spa visitors were included. You mentioned the poor non-paying guests and servants who were excluded. And you said some of the peasants, but not always. And women were only sometimes included, but sometimes they were actually. Mm -hmm. Could you mention some examples for these in and exclusions? And were you able to find patterns when certain groups, for instance, peasants or women were in or excluded? So this was already my last point and I would like to end my comment here. And I'm very curious about your answers. Thank you so much for, for this uh... Very interesting questions. I will have some kind of answers to all of them, I'm quite sure. I'll just like to, as I uh, unfortunately, of course, chose the wrong uh, variation of, of my PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'd like to show you, as you like, the, the examples. You can get the literary example as well. Can you see Fredeka Bremer's Nina now? Yes. You? Yeah, okay. Uh, this is a novel then. And she wrote it, uh, published it in 1835 when she was already a, a famous author, read by a lot of Swedish people. And this is about uh, Nina going to Ramlösa, the, south, yeah, the spa in the south of Sweden. Do you see how they greet each other and slowly walk towards the spring? There they meet the poor, the rich, the high, the low. Those sick in body, those sick in soul, they all go to suck li new life at the bosom of nature, the good mother. Her sources are meant for everyone, all of us. She does not distinguish between her children. She knows not of stepchildren, but offers her life and her strength to them all. So here you see how she substitutes the, the God the Father 
with the good mother, but the message is the same and the position of the spa, including everyone in some respect, is still there. So I wanted to show you. Sorry about uh, missing Adam early. I'll try to take your questions uh, in order. I might have um, forgotten some of them. Um, how they, uh, the travels, yes, of course, they traveled uh, a lot. And uh, the founding father of uh, the Swedish past, this man, Urban Jane, was more or less sent on a spying uh, trip um, all over Europe and, and uh, the British Isles uh, already before they started with Swedish uh, spas. Um, a nobleman gave him money so he could do a, a tour, a grand tour, but very much uh, into spa life. And you can study this, of course. Uh, unfortunately, his, his handwriting is, is awful. No one really has been able to decipher it. Uh, but he's also made pictures, um, very nice pictures of uh, places he's gone. And you can read some of it, uh, as it is um, in a mixture of Swedish, German and Latin, it's, uh, it's difficult. But you can definitely see that he visited these places and that he takes this uh, knowledge of how to um, make a good spa work with him back to Sweden. And also the, the spa doctors later on, they go on, on tours in, 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 on the continent and in Europe to see how they, how they work. And they also go down when there is a new uh, idea like, uh, like uh, visiting the, the cold water sources in the 19th century and, and the Sebastian Kneipp places or whatever. Whenever there's something new, the Swedish Swedes go down and check it and start uh, similar things in Sweden. They hardly ever, as far as I can see, import people. They uh, sort of, they get interested, they have a lot of correspondence, they have contacts uh, mainly in Germany, but also in, the, in Denmark and in, the, in the different places in, in the, in the, on the continent and in, in, in England, and they, they know very quickly when things happen and they are very much interested in it. But of course, some, some like it and some, some don't. Some adhere to the old traditions and some to the, the newer ones. But they definitely do not only read, they also correspond with these people and they actually visit these places already from the beginning. Um, when it comes to different kinds of spas, it's uh, true that uh, you could get the idea from my book that there is only mineral springs where you actually mostly drink the water in uh, either great quantities or very small uh, medicinal way. But uh, that's, of course, not the case. It's just that I've concentrated on this uh, as it was has a, had a starting point and something of an, an, uh, an end around uh, the end of the 19th century. Uh, yeah. yeah, yes, something like that. But uh, we definitely have in Sweden all these seaside res resorts. Um, and some of the places that were mineral springs also had the opportunity to offer, um, we have a lot of coastline in Sweden. So they also had the opportunity to offer seaside resorts and um, bathing in the sea. Though, uh, to start with, they took the water from the sea, heated it and, and offered it in bathtubs. That was the usual way to start it. But later on, say in the middle of the 19th century, they started bathing in the, in the sea as well. There was not as um, far as I can see this, this hard um, uh, resistance or, or uh, that uh, people chose uh, one or the other, or that the, the, those who had the spas fought among themselves. Um, that seems to have been a very easygoing coexistence of, of spas, inland spas, and, and these seaside resorts during the time that I studied in England. 
Um, there were also in more environmental spas a um, bit later, from the 1880s or so, when I stopped, because uh, the people with, with um, lung diseases were not uh, admitted to, to the usual spas that I've studied. But when uh, those problems became more prominent within Swedish society, they started um, more like, uh, like Thomas Mann places in the north of Sweden, where we have a lot of, of uh, pine trees, you can see. But that was uh, originally different. They, they might be just half a mile off or, or just up the hill or something, but they, uh, they severed this uh, um, usual old-fashioned spa from these more, more uh, uh, modern ideas of, of uh, spa. Then we also had these uh, special for arsenic sauces. Uh, that was also one. And also you wondered about the mud. We, the famous Swedish mud place was Loka, and they had uh, mud treatments very early on and they were famous for it. And in the beginning, they, they uh, exported their mud to other uh, spas in Sweden and perhaps abroad as well. Um, but later on, people found mud that you could use in different places. So it was common to combine mud treatment, massage and things like that with um, the old fashioned kind of spa treatment. Uh, when then you asked about this um, tendency to place the Swedish spas in the campus side and in the middle of nowhere. And I think one reason was that when it all started with Urban Järne doing his travels in Europe, he also made a survey of all Sweden about what, like Linnaeus had did later on. But he did it uh, by sending out a questionnaire to all the doctors, mainly the, the, the priests within the Swedish church, I think, who um, told uh, to fill this in and sent this to Stockholm back. And he made huge statistics about what uh, kinds of, of uh, minerals uh, were available or whatever and also about mineral springs. So then he got from all kinds of places, this idea, this information about where there were mineral springs. And most of these people were out in the countryside. And he also either went there himself or made them send uh, samples of their water and made a very thorough um, investigation of the chemical results during, uh, well, according to his uh, rather old fashioned ideas. Uh, but nevertheless, he decided that uh, the spa of Medevi was the very best. And then he sort of um, more or less prohibited anyone else from starting another for a, for a spa for a while, because he thought that the Swedish community could not support more than one. So if it, if it was supposed to work, uh, there had to be only one, at least to start with. And he actually managed to do that for a while. And then there was, uh, then were others uh, in the 1720s and onwards, there were maybe five or six, and then, and then they expanded even further. But that I think might be a reason why uh, they knew about all these very uh, remote places where there were mineral springs of interest. But of course, there were also um, minerals sort of uh, springs in, in Stockholm or in, in, in different uh, cities around uh, Sweden, but they were, there was never a very good uh, spa that developed into a city like, or a town even. Um, even if they had special jurisdiction, even if they had all these things, uh, they were just alive for a couple of months in the summer and then were, were um, abandoned during the winter, apart from 
later on during the First and Second World War, when uh, refugees uh, were housed in these, uh, these uh, spas. Then you asked about uh, the trimmings, sort of, uh, what it looked like if, if the Swedish spas had all these uh, cool packs and promenades and, and, uh, and uh, fancy hotels and, and everything, and they did. Uh, after fashion, depending on how much money they had for the moment. But, uh, but they did have all of these things apart from the casino. It was not allowed to have casinos. There were in the south of Sweden at the Spa of Ramlösa for a short time uh, some Danish people who ha actually had a, a roulette going, but it was uh, strictly forbidding in Sweden, in, according to Swedish law, to have, have uh, betting on, uh, or anything to do with money. Um, I think they probably cheated with this um, here and there. And also they, they may, might have, have done some things with, with very little money and no one bothered. But um, casinos were not, were not part of, of uh, the Swedish bars. And that, of course, was perhaps one reason why they had very uh, large problems with, with, uh, with the economy. And. Uh, then you asked about the transnational aspect when it came to guests, and there was there were definitely a lot of, of um, foreign guests at Swedish bars uh, during the 18th and 19th century and onwards. Um, Sweden is very good on statistics. Uh, since the middle of the 18th century, there are statistics about everything about the Swedish uh, society, about the Swedish population, with what they are. Uh, what their occupation are, what, how tall they are, how many there are, anything. You can find statistics on, on almost everything. And also there were uh, doctors sending in statistics of, of these spas every year to the medical board in, in Stockholm. And these are kept in the start of the state archives in, in Stockholm up until now. And uh, you can also see this uh, if you don't want to go flat, you can see the the the, the advertisements and the the leaflets that they produce and distribute uh, that they are in different languages: uh, Swedish, English, French, and German. Sometimes even in Russian. And uh, Sweden had Swedish spas had especially many. Uh, foreign guests when there were trouble in Europe or in uh, Russia. So, say during the French Revolution, um, during uh, the First World War, for instance, there were lots and lots of, of people coming to Swedish baths because they couldn't go to the, the European baths that they usually visited. But even if that was not the case, we had visitors from, from the United States, from, from all kinds of places. Also from Finland, uh, of course. Uh, Finland, uh, when I say that Sweden was the only uh, Nordic country having spas in, established early on, that includes Finland because Finland was also a, a part of Sweden at that time. There is no older one, but there is definitely 18th century ones. And also Matti Kling, a famous uh, Finnish historian, his grandfather owned one of them and learned uh, during a waltz at some uh, conference or other. So there certainly were in Finland as well. I have actually tried to find it uh, and I found the, the uh, spring in the middle of a field where people were um, walking with their dogs. You can see it was, it was uh, a lot of iron in it because it was sort of orange. Uh, in the vegetation around it. And you can see it's parts of the, the wooden pipes that they had had once upon a time. But unfortunately, a couple of years ago, they built a huge skyscrapers in this uh, area. So now it's definitely gone. Um, and I think uh, I have uh, in my book, uh, this one. Okay. This one. This one. See, it's I have definitely a lot of examples of um, international travels and 
foreign guests as well. Um, whether we imported any doctors or spa workers, I'm not quite sure. Um, I can't, cannot really remember uh, anyone turning up in my material, but I've, uh, my studies end more or less around 1880. I've done a, a further study of, of Ronnebybrunn um, when it had a jubilee of some kind in 2005, I think. And then I, I saw this um, um, development during the First and Second World War. Um, and also um, all these uh, leaflets in, in, uh, in Russian and French. Uh, but I suppose there might have been a lot of, of uh, spa workers uh, visiting Sweden later on, from the 1880s and onwards in the, 19th, in the 20th century. And I uh, unfortunately know nothing about that. Oh. When it comes to inclusive and exclusive people um, or ideas about uh, who to include and exclude, um, concentrated more on the inclusions, the more important, the more uh, unusual include. Uh, features that that I found, um, but I was I'm also very clear on the point that the Swedish spas uh, were mainly visited by ordinary people and also poor people, um, destitute uh, on the at the expense of either the the spa itself and all the the philanthropic works they did there, or by the, their parish. Uh, the church uh, paid for for visits for for poor people and the uh, servants and anyone who needed a time of rest and some, some medical care. So there were uh, we don't have any I think uh, spa where there were no poor people, no uh, people there for. Later on, they were called gratister, meaning that they were there gratis and uh, without paying. But in the early days, there, there were no name for them. They were just there. But what is usually called hospital uh, on the spa maps, that those are the, the abodes of the poor. It's not a, for the sick, especially sick people. It's for the poor people who stay there. And they sort of, they slept two or maybe four in the same bed, and, but they got a time of rest. They got food, they got uh, care, and they got access to this uh, mineral springs for drinking for free. I don't think they got these uh, mineral baths for free. Um, they had to pay for them, as did the people, uh, the rich people visiting. Also, later on, the, the spa parks, those cool park, uh, the bigger environment sometimes um, was, was uh, surrounded by a, a, something that, um, uh, that kept people out of this area and they had entrances and you had to pay a small sum of, of money just to walk in there. Um, but that was later on, not the, the period that I've studied, but later on in the end of the 90s and the beginning of the 20th century, I think that was the case. So people were sort of excluded and sort of included. Also, there were, uh, when I say it, there were no hierarchies, there were, of course, hierarchies. And there were also uh, in Sweden, like in everywhere else, first class and second class and third class guests uh, eating and uh, being accommodated in different places. But they, uh, they were not. And they were there, um, they choose uh, which um, class they wanted to be in. I don't really know what happened if they chose very strangely, but, but the poor noblemen could choose not to be in the first class because they couldn't afford it. A lot of them couldn't. 
and that means that they could eat more cheaply and live more cheaply also, and and provide their own uh, cutlery and their own uh, sheets and blankets and things and some of them brought their own servants and their carriages and things so there were very different opportunities for for people staying in this place. Um, but still they most of them could meet in the park and uh, at these uh, public dances. And there were certainly different uh, ideas about this uh, during all these um, centuries that I've studied. But what uh, surprised me was, was the inclusive elements. For instance, uh, uh, there is um, there's pop, uh, I, there seems to be it seems to be possible for women to play billiards at the uh, spa of Medevi in the 18th century, um, but maybe billiards was another kind of. Uh, I mean, it was was billiards on a on a on a board like the others. It's still there, but um, maybe different ideas were associated with it. Maybe not so many cigars and, and, uh, and uh, male people. So I have looked more for those inclusive things than things that, uh, that uh, resembled uh, society in, uh, in general. Have I completely forgotten any of your questions? No, you have answered them all. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Very okay. interesting. I wanted to give you the possibility to to mention more than you have mentioned in your uh, lecture, because I know you have written so much about Swedish spas, and that's why I ask all these detailed questions. And okay. I think it was very interesting to get to know more about Swedish spas and Zen general. And as I said before, I was really amazed by these examples you had. Mm. And maybe more. Yes. I have more of them. Yes, <laughs> I can those are the best. that. Maybe the audience has some more as well. Yeah, but let's I, hear. Yeah, that would be interesting, actually. Yes, indeed. I'll pass over to Henrique now, who has been managing the chat and who knows who's on the speakers list. So please, Henrique. And of course, the audience has questions. And uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for taking your time and having energy and sharing the whole afternoon with us. On the speakers list are Thomas van der Dank, Kathleen, and Christian and Ludmilla in this uh, row, please. And uh, please be, be short so that uh, Elizabeth has time to, to, to react. Thank you. So Thomas, you might start. Yes, uh, one can hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I have two short questions. Uh, you said uh, that the climate isn't very fav favorable in Sweden for spas and living at spas. Uh, my question is, where are those spas situated in Sweden? I think for the climate, it will make a lot of difference if you are situated in the neighborhood of, of Malmö or in the far north beyond Kiruna. That's my first question. Where are, are they, most of them, situated? It will, I think it will influence the season, the spa season and so on. And the second question is, in fact, the reverse about the internationality of the spas in Sweden itself. It is Sweden. The, the Swedish went abroad to spas in the rest of Europe, or were they happy by having their own and said, well, that's too far away, we stay at home. So that's are my two questions. Okay, uh, easily answered. And you're, of course, quite right. Uh, most of the Swedish spas were in the south of Sweden. Uh, but there were spas in the, in the north as well. Uh, Sundsvall is some, somewhere, uh, well, around the middle. Uh, of, of the country if you if you look at it. But uh, there were also in Piteå, which is far north. So there were mineral springs and some activities around these places as well, but uh, but mainly they were in the south of Sweden, where the summer is good enough. But, uh, but the problem was that the winter dis destroyed more or less what they had done before. So it was very expensive to start it up in the, in the spring again and make uh, this lush gardens that we actually needed and mend all the windows and, and uh, uh, find new keys for everyone who's gone home with theirs. There are complaints, uh, of course. Uh, 
climate. And then, um, visits, did I get your question right? Did the Swedes visit the, the Europe? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. Uh, just as, I mean, uh, I think it was more or less like it is today. Uh, most people want to go abroad to the fashionable places uh, and uh, also visit different things. And also, of course, the doctor said you should change your, your uh, environment. You should make new uh, uh, acquaintances and, and experience new places. So, of course, they did. Uh, they mainly went, went to, to uh, Germany. I must admit, uh, a lot of them did. The romanticists, Jäger and Atterdom, they, they went to, to uh, different spas in Germany. But there were others who went to, to England or, or even further. So they definitely traveled a lot. So it's people should do. Thank you for your question. And then I think I'm next on deck for questions. Um, yeah, your talk was very lovely. Thank you. It reminded me, um, I went to Sweden for the first time this past summer uh, because of the wild camping, which is mm. very unique. And mm. um, it's free to legal to do it there because of the policy, the Alice Manraten. I don't know how to mm. say it. Mm. Um, but I, I loved that idea that nature is there for everyone to enjoy mm. regardless. And I was wondering, um, it reminded me of this utopian egalitarian aspect of the Swedish spas. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you thought maybe there was a connection about one maybe informing or, or molding the other. Yeah, well, I think uh, there must, might well be, um, or else there is a third sort of this uh, kind of, of religious idea that uh, is the, the founding of both of them. Um, but you're quite right. We do have this allemans right? That means that that nature is is there for everyone, unless it's uh, your uh, garden very close to your house with fences around. I must look into it further to see if there is actually one, um, because I don't really know when this allemans right? was was uh, sort of. Uh, put into writing as a, a, a law or legal right. It is sort of a general idea that that sort of has been there as far as I remember everything. I don't know. A, a, an interesting thought. I'll look it up. Thank you. I guess then it's my turn for at least the first of my questions. Uh, and this is, uh, again, a simple one, um, because I'm now uh, looking a bit more into the 20th century uh, as a less kind of uh, uh, researched uh, part of the spa history. And I wonder whether spa treatments were recognized and refunded in the social welfare system of 20th century Sweden. No, unfortunately not. Uh, spa enthusiasts looked uh, to Germany with, with envy. Uh, it was not. Um, it was considered uh, well, you could do it or you could not, but, but uh, there, were, there were no homeopathic medicines or, or any uh, spa visits or anything like that uh, encouraged by, by, uh, by law or, or by giving any money away for it. Um, and it's not uh, I don't think it's nowadays either, actually. Um, unfortunately. Thank you. Spas. And I think uh, I, I haven't studied it uh, thoroughly all 19th century, but I did make quite a study of this uh, spa of Ronneby. And you might say that most spas in Sweden um, discontinued their activity around the end of the Second World War, maybe. And uh, the, the last ones went out of um, practice in, in the 1960s, 70s. But so, then some of them come back. Okay. But the uh, middle of the 1975 was not a good year for, for uh, Swedish spa. 
But now we have spas and, and uh, uh, modern spas as well uh, that has no old history, but they usually like their, their old history. They want me to lecture and come with my old book and, and uh, tell them about it. So it's uh, sort of a Japanese Asian spa in Norway on the coast or, or in the Swedish, uh, the outside of Stockholm. Or so they like their history, but they do what they like with it. As well. Elizabeth, and we like the topic, so they are still dropping in uh, questions. So if that would be okay, we have Ludmila Kuznetsova and Armel Korno for two questions or three. And then uh, maybe Christian is standing in line again for a short follow up, if that's okay with you. It's definitely okay with me. It was, it's uh, been a long time since I've been uh, talking about this in an international uh, environment I, I recognize for that. Okay. Quite enjoy myself. Thank you. Um, good evening, um, and thank you for your amazing presentation. I have two brief questions. Um, the first one, and actually, I'm I'm sorry in advance if I uh, will ask you about some big person, and probably you actually wanted to put like less uh, well-known person in your uh, research. Well, but still, uh, when we talk about the ideas of utopia, uh, th these ideas might be connected with very different context. And actually, I wanted to ask you about, about the idea of utopia from Olaf Rudbeck and this big idea mm -hmm. of Atlantida. Mm -hmm. It was this spa utopian ideas somehow or in some way connected with this Atlantida ideas? Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first question. And the next one is about um, utopian characteristic. You described precisely, and it was very interesting about this uh, idea of equality as one of the, uh, one of the characteristic of utopia. But what about other characteristics? For example, what about drinking alcohol? Does it like was forbidden or was welcomed? Or what about clothes? And so, for example, um, did they have to wear a tie, for example, in spa? Or it was like a, uh, some mark from non-freedom society, I don't know. So some other characteristics that also might be connected with this utopian idea. Well, uh, that's all, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thank you for your uh, interesting questions. Uh, I know nothing about uh, Rubeck's uh, uh, connection to spa culture. Um, and I don't know anyone who has claimed that uh, these Atlantic ideas about Sweden being uh, the, the famous uh, Atlantis in, in Plato's uh, writings. I, I've never seen it uh, referred to in this, uh, but that doesn't mean that it does not exist. I have not uh, stumbled upon it, so I don't know anything about Rubik's connection to this. When it comes to other spa, uh, other utopian ideas, um, of course it differed in many ways. Um, when you arrived, each and every spa guest arriving at a Swedish spa had to visit the spa uh, physician and get a special uh, ordinance for, for how to, to take the waters and, and how to uh, use the baths and what to drink and eat and so on, based on his examination of you and perhaps also on the, what they said that their uh, doctor at home had said and, and what they told them about their health, uh, state of health. But uh, it was definitely uh, allowed to drink alcohol for most of the part. Uh, sometimes it was not uh, um, recommended to drink alcohol. Sometimes it was not recommended to drink coffee or tea either, or perhaps even chocolate. Uh, so it differed. But um, um, when it came to prohibitions of this kind when it came to eating and drinking there were always people uh, managing to to circumvent this so um, I think they more or less ate 
and drank and also played cards as much as they wanted to. But they were not supposed to do that all, you know. Uh, they were supposed to sleep tight at night and so forth, but they didn't always do that. When it comes to clothes, uh, I think it was more relaxed. Uh, as I mentioned, sometimes you were not allowed to raise your hat, for instance. Uh, it was also in one, uh, in another novel by Sophie von Knorring, another um, very well known Swedish author in the middle of the 19th century, not selling as much as Vindika Bjarne, but maybe, well, maybe she did. Um, she had another, she had a story in a novel about a woman and her daughter uh, going to the spa of Medevi. Um, and finding when they arrived that you were not allowed to wear anything uh, fashionable, uh, not satin and silk, not even if you were a duchess or so. You were uh, supposed to wear simple cotton dresses sewn by the, the local seamstresses, uh, according to age old uh, ideas of, of that. So, and they had, uh, of course, uh, gone to Stockholm and I think Copenhagen as well beforehand and uh, uh, purchased all kinds of beautiful dresses to show off at this uh, spa uh, site but they ha had to remain in their in their pack they never unpacked them and then of course when they came home it was uh, unfashionable because fashion changed quickly in those times as well and uh, the reflection of these uh, these women, at least the mother, was that this had turned out to be a very expensive uh, visit because two sets of clothes had to be procured. But the story and the reader of this story is supposed to find this uh, a good idea and a, a sort of liberating idea and a dear idea of equality that you could easily find at a spa. So it's it's not a true story, but still it's uh, it's spread widely spread and it had to be sort of plausible, at least, and understandable. That's what I know about clothes. Actually, you, you can see all kinds of pictures, and they seem to wear about the same as English do. Is that okay? Yes, thank you so much. And then I think it's uh, my, my turn to ask a question. Um, thank you very much for all of these perspectives. It's really quite enlightening. Um, I, I have a one brief question about the question of um, transported waters. Um, I am really curious as to how, um, well, how do if the waters were transported if it was the same ones um, from the spa towns that were also made their ways into bottles and if you know how early that started um and yeah if there was any kind of discourse coming from perhaps the towns themselves the physicians on the benefits of one over the other i'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on this okay that's a very interesting question uh, and i uh, know that I've, I've treated it in my book. Uh, whether I remember everything is, is another question. But we definitely did uh, transport a lot of water. I mean, from the start, you had to uh, go, you, you got your, your physician's idea of what was wrong with you and maybe other members of your family. And then you had to travel to all these places, Ems or Piemont or some Swedish ones and whatever, to get Aachen trying all these waters and, and trying to, to cure all the different illnesses that you and your family had. But then, of course, you could um, buy bottled water from these sources uh, and also from the Swedish uh, wells and, and spas, Ramlösa, uh, Loka, and so on. When did it start? In the middle of the 18th century, I'm quite sure they have, have this. Uh, further on, say, around the turn of the century, right, 1800 or so, um, the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th, uh, we started making um, artificial mineral waters. Imse Vasa, but not from Ems. Um, Kölner Vasa, but not from Köln. Um, so 
they distributed that and, and manufactured that. And this man that I mentioned, the chemist Berzelius, he uh, he was uh, part of this uh, this uh, setting setting this up. And there were also a man whom I remember, hmm, I do not remember the name of, who had the idea that we should create a water pharmacy where actually you had only the uh, the actual mineral water with not so many ingredients in and then you had sort of small packages or, or uh, with all kinds of ingredients that you could add to it and that could be like a poor man's uh, medicine everything could be contained in this water and the, the additions would be cheap and, and, and easy to find so you could cure everything with, with this water with some, some um, things added to it. And of course, then there were uh, big industries of, of collecting, uh, distributing this water. And sometimes there were uh, on these labels, they said it contains arsenic and that was good. And then they, uh, well, you know, uh, took it away a little later. So there were there are still of course a huge industry of of, uh, of distributing uh, uh, water from Ramla, Saloka uh, and uh, and all over and also from small springs and, and mineral places where that i've never heard of but i get uh, sometimes on the man i'm on a flight over the ocean or something uh, so we do do it still definitely transport water all over but uh, i must admit that when in Sweden, we have uh, tap water that usually works fairly well. And in the 1860s and 70s, I remember that um, when I went abroad with my parents as a child, I was astonished that people uh, bought water in bottles uh, in the stores, that anyone was interested to do that. Uh, and I think the Swedes were, were sort of not uh, didn't understand that at all so it felt like a, a custom that they have in the south of Europe where they are you know very different from us um, and uh, it, but of course now we have a lot kinds of water in, in Swedish stores as well and have had for a long time but, uh, but it has changed the idea of, of, of uh, buying bottled water Thank you very much. If you send me an email, I'll try to find mm -hmm. out what, uh, what my book says about how early they started out with, with the bottling and sending. Uh, I haven't studied it specially, but, but I have, must, must have some examples. I usually do. Okay, uh, I think then I'm the last on the list and to the, the closing question. But before that, please put me into, into the CC for that email because it looks like that Armel and myself uh, are sharing a certain interest in this business. Okay. Um, just back, and I'm just back from Spa, right? Uh -huh. um, where they started uh -huh. exporting things really yes. early. Um, <laughs> Right, but my question is not about spa, but about Sweden. And I was intrigued uh, by this mentioning of a special jurisdiction. Yes. And I was wondering whether that was something that was centrally organized and bestowed in a kind of standard statute for spa places, or whether that did differ over times and distances. Yes, uh, it was... Uh bestowed individually to, to special spas um, and I think it was one and one reason was that they were so very far from everywhere else so um, this uh, spa community became also the, the judging quality not for murders but I don't think there were such a lot of murders going on but maybe there were uh, but uh, of course there were some some uh, uh, someone is or some entity in Stockholm um, handling this and you had to to apply for it and it could be granted and it was granted to to maybe five six I don't know 
few of the, the bigger ones. I know med we had one, I think, uh, uh, Ramlösa, Satra, Luca, Porla, maybe. Yeah, that would be very interesting for our project in, indeed, also to see um, um, in terms of the relative chronologies in Europe. When mm. did it happen? Um, what was included? Um, mm. Was it regulating more social life or were there sort of environmental protection aspects in it as mm. far as the sources were concerned and so on and so forth? So perhaps we will enter into some more detailed yeah, uh, communication think, about that, if you may. Yes, because uh, I haven't uh, I, I noticed now that I have, haven't said anything about the rules and regulations because mm -hmm. there were, of course, a lot of rules and regulations. Uh, on on uh, on paper pasted on the, on the walls so you could see whatever you could do and could not do but one interesting feature of this that i found out uh, during my studies was that you were actually expected uh, to break some of these rules and pay the fine because that was a, uh, um, a, another idea of of uh, procuring money for the poor at the spa so you should take your uh, dog with you to the the morning sermons or something that you were not allowed to do or take take uh, take the dog to to the spring in the morning or whatever you were not supposed to do or absent yourself from the evening sermons or whatever that you shouldn't do uh, and pay the fine for it uh, that was uh, considered uh, the thing so that's uh, that, that there is yes. a, that there is a rules and regulations doesn't even in sweden mean that they were actually followed and, uh, to. Thank you. Sort of, I mean, um, the impression that I share probably with my colleagues is that we should have three or four talks with you in the next couple of weeks, a month. Perhaps we can do that sort of on oh, more of, a, of an email yeah. exchange basis. Definitely. But there are so many questions and so many interesting aspects that you raised. Um, so I take the liberty to probably close the discussion here and say a huge thank you for your both your interesting presentation the many interesting aspects that you raised. And um, yes, I hope uh, either through Wiebke or directly, we can be in touch and uh, sort of perhaps yes. learn a bit more about a few of uh, the details. I am Remain easily found. If you have my name, I mean, there aren't very many with those. So. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I would wish to thank on behalf of the European SPAS project team, everyone who's been with us, uh, this late Friday afternoon uh, with this enjoyable presentation. Thank you. Uh, as I initially mentioned, we'll have a next meeting in two weeks' times. And I see that Sabina is with us uh, this afternoon as well. Um, so um, she will uh, enlighten us about the architecture of bandstands, uh, which I hope were present in Swedish spas as well, although we didn't mention them today. So thank you all for coming and um, be with us again in two weeks' time. Thank you. And thank you very much for your interest and time.